and welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Episode 38. Here we are. God, I hope it's 38. I don't know. Let me go check. <laughs> I, I usually change the number after I finish the episode, but I don't know if I did. Yes, it is 38. Episode 38. Here we go. I'm wearing a shirt that has not been ironed. I just tore it off the rack. I said, I got to do this show. I got I got legions of fans ready to go, ready to hear this recording. They want to know, how was leg day? I, and you know what? It was good. I'm going to pull up Strava and see how good it was. <laughs> no, let me do that. Welcome back in. Let's get to we we got a lot to talk about. But first, the uh, look. There's no movement. I we we're we're in a moment where um, there. I mean, in every sector, from what I could tell, there's no jobs anywhere for anything. Ridiculous. It doesn't matter how. Uh, it's it's so funny because again, <laughs> I'll be on I'll be on LinkedIn. The worst, the worst uh, platform in the world, and second worst after TikTok. But I'll be on LinkedIn, and somebody will be like, "I haven't had a job for a month. It's testing my faith. I this is I'm looking. I'm have to look forward every day, and I'm trying to keep positive, honey. We, we gotta switch lives because <laughs> your month and my month are completely different. But it's ridiculous. I can't find anything." And uh, that's the end of that. All right, let's go on to, I don't even have LinkedIn open. Let's go on to uh, the first story. This comes from the New York Times. You know, I'm going to say this. They all come from the New York Times. That's just how the, the that's how it happened. From Jacob Meshke and Santol Nurkar. Also, full disclosure, I just found this story. The last one's going to be a big one, but. These first two are ones. Well, the second one, the second one I found last week. I wanted to do it because it pertains to the news. Let's get on with this. Caitlin Clark is here. Can the business of the WNBA flourish? We Caitlin Clark is not the first WNBA player. As much as uh, people want you to believe, she's not the first WNBA player ever. But we are in this to take a term, to borrow a term for, uh, from the modern day internet speak era. Of, uh, uh, of 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 uh, of Caitlin Clark, as well as you know, a lot of women in her class, um, bringing to light what women's basketball is, and yeah, it's just as fast as men's. It can be just as nail biting, and it can be just as fun. I was watching the Indiana Fever last night. They were playing uh, somebody. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's say Las Vegas. And uh, Indiana lost in the last, like, 11 seconds of the game. Again, I only watched, like, the fourth quarter. I was going to bed, and this was what was on television, so I turned it on. And the the crowd was big. They were loud. They were vibrant. I'm so happy to see this. I hope it goes on throughout the season, this type of support, and not just for Caitlin, but for everybody else. Um, I don't know where I was going with this, but <laughs> but the uh, the WNBA is uh, right now to me just exploding thanks to and I know I bashed it earlier, but thanks to TikTok, thanks to uh, young women on social media, thanks to um, uh, 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 men who can finally go, oh no, I've always who, who can lie, who can lie, go, oh, I've always watched women's basketball. <laughs> no, you didn't. But interest has been boosted and ticket sales have happened. Oh, I know I, why I said what I said about the last night. But I was I was commenting to nobody to the pets that, uh, you know the for for like three years straight the Atlanta Dream, which is the women's team here in Atlanta, they had to they went from like the Georgia Tech Stadium to. Uh, a stadium south of the city, and then I believe last year they were at um, uh, the State Farm Arena for a little bit. But it, it's it was a little it was disconcerting to see the team bounce around and not have a home. 
Like they should be playing at State Farm, especially if nothing's going on at State Farm. They might, I mean, just bring them to State Farm or bring them back to Tech. Because when I went to Tech, it was it was fine. It was good. All the teams, leagues, uh, all the league's teams, rather, will now fly charter for the first time this season. That that deal was brought up last week. Sponsorships are growing, and marquee players are racking up great endorsement deals. A new TV deal could fill its coffers and further elevate the league's profile. And I really think, and also another thing I was commenting to nobody last night except for the pets and the ghosts, is that I was taking a nap on, uh, what was it, on Thursday, I think. And... Um, the pets were outside on the porch, on the balcony, and I felt a breath on the back of my neck. I swear to God, it was a ghost. <laughs> but I, but what I was commenting to myself was that there needs to, like three years ago, three or, three or four years ago, I would have signed some type of deal if I was ESPN or NBC Sports or just a sports purveyor with a cable and broadcasting platform or even a streaming service. I would have... I would have offered up money for the WNBA streaming, not streaming rights. Well, yeah, for the streaming rights, if I was a streaming service, but for the uh, for the broadcast rights, I would have like not just playoffs. I'm saying I would have offered up money for year round things, and I would have I would have taken the loss that it was in hopes that in a couple of years people would be going, hey, women's women's basketball is interesting because you like you couldn't you can't predict this. But it would have happened regardless. The same thing goes for, uh, you know, the rights for soccer. Soccer streaming rights went crazy for for Netflix and for Paramount and for uh, uh, Peacock. So now, right now, the average NBA WNBA player is around one hundred twenty thousand dollars, which is very low compared to NBA, and uh, it's prompted some of the highest. Player, sign, highest earning players to play overseas during the league's off season in order to make extra money. You know to live. The league and don't and don't and, and if you're a person who makes over a hundred thousand dollars and you're like I don't see what the big deal is. They make a, a decent salary. They play professional sports. They need to make a living wage, comparative to not only the male counterparts but to the level at which they're playing. $120,000 is good for an accountant or, you know, whatever it is you do. But for a basketball player, that's nothing. More than 18 million people in a record watched the University of South Carolina beat Clark, uh, 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 Caitlin Clark at Iowa in the women's NCAA tournament that final this year, which is up 10 million who watched the title game in 2023, which was a record in of itself. This year, for the first time, more people watched the women's final than the men's. Supporters of the WNBA are hoping that the growth in college games translates to the pros. Last year's finals averaged 728,000 viewers per game, the highest in 20 years. Sue Bird, she used to, if you know her, she used to play for a Seattle Storm and the uh, University of Connecticut, said in an interview that compared with 2002 when she entered the league, the WNBA is taken more seriously by fans. The common sentiment, uh, sentiment rather, back then, Bird said, was that, quote, you were taking a step down from playing college basketball. Two point five million people, a record again, watched the WNBA draft on April 15th. That's where uh, Caitlin Clark was selected number one. Overall, three of the uh, Fever's first four games are nationally televised on ESPN, ESPN2, and ABC. The other was on Amazon Prime. As a testament to the league's own growing popularity, the Bay Area will get a WNBA team in 2025, and another team will is reportedly planned in Toronto. That I did not know. Clark's... Uh, starting salary is about 76000 Again, that's way more than me, right? <laughs> Up from zero. <laughs> $76,535. Uh, her college endorsements, which are valued at more than $3 million, according to On3, a site that tracks name, image, and likeness deals for college athletes, and ones she has signed with since getting into Indiana. Indiana. 
make her base salary a small portion of her overall compensation. Compensation. Base salaries for the WNBA is sixty four thousand for rookies. Uh, drafted in third round to about two hundred and forty thousand for veterans. Out of roughly one hundred and forty four players in the league, twenty two make more than two hundred thousand annually, and seventy eight make less than a hundred thousand, according to Sport Track. Sport Track, a site that tracks players' contracts. Hopefully, ownership. We can see ownership. We can see. Uh, GMs, we can see a lot of factors outside of just sponsorships really add to the paycheck of a WNBA player and the coaches and everybody else that's not above the line. To put it frankly, I just heard the sigh of a dog. (laughs) Sick of hearing this. Because, you know, I go over this beforehand. I say it out loud. (laughs) These new deals are very important. They could change everything. And it's the money will come from, again, outside sources. Clark is reportedly signing a $20 million deal with Nike, which makes sense for her. Angel Reese is also in her rookie season with the Chicago Sky. Had NIL deals worth uh, reported $1.8 million while at Louisiana State University. Asia Wilson from the Las Vegas Aces is uh, signed a deal with Nike, apparently. Making a signature shoe. Companies are going to have to jump in on this. Get on the get in on the ground floor. Cause even if this season first, if you never watch the WNBA, you don't know how the season's gonna turn out. But even if this season doesn't turn out the exact way that they think it's gonna be, they think Caitlin Clark is gonna be the uh, the MVP, the excuse me, the W MVP. <laughs> and <laughs> that would be a great title if this was the Constitutionals. Uh, they think Caitlin's going to be the WMVP. <laughs> I said it jokingly before, but now it's a real thing. The MVP. They think they're going to have all these all this viewership. The point is to maintain the viewership and to also talk it up as much as possible. That's how that's how we're going to be able to help people like Clark and Asia and every other woman playing in the WNBA and all the coaches and all the trainers and everybody else to get paid and to and, and and to have more games just watch the game support them talk about it do it do everything you possibly can as much as you talk about the NBA talk about the WNBA speaking of talking this comes from the New York Times written by Jim Rutenberg and Michael M Grinbaum how MSNBC's leftward tilt delivers ratings and complications there's Fox News, which is on the far right. I'm sorry. That's If you're watching the video, I am pointing to the right, camera right. No, that's camera left. But it's pointing right. It's reversed. It's your from a nip of flammy up the mall. Was it worth it? No. But Fox News is far right, and they're winning in terms of uh, viewership. CNN's down the middle. But if you're David Zaslav, it used to point a little bit toward the right. (laughs) CNN's down the middle, and they're coming in at a comfortable third. Not a comfortable third. Uneasy third. And then MSNBC, hire me back, baby, and I will will help make CNN number two to the minimum. (laughs) I'm not promising the moon. I'm promising the stratosphere, the mesosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere. (laughs) MSNBC is on the left. They're fighting, they're fighting this war with the news, MSNBC. They're hiring people uh, like Jen Psaki. They're hiring, they have uh, people like uh, Rachel Maddow, who are openly chastising former President Donald Trump on the air. Those those type of moves have been huge for MSNBC. They leapfrog 
passes erstwhile rival CNN in the ratings and has uh, seen viewership rise over the past year, securing second place in cable news behind the perennial leader, Fox News. But MSNBC's success has had unintended consequences for its parent company, NBC, an original big three broadcaster that still strives to appeal to mass to a mass American audience. The difference between, before we get into this, MSNBC and NBC Nightly News and the Today Show, the broadcast and the, and the cable, is that they're able to, they don't have to, they don't have to appeal to that mass. They don't, they're able to, to lean to one side and develop stories in that way because people, people, companies like Fox News have opened up the door and even CNN have opened up the door for that to happen. Isn't CNN's the oldest one, right? Yeah, I think so. Local station, the local NBC stations between the coasts have demanded again and again that executives in New York do more to preserve NBC's nonpartisan brand, lest MSNBC's blue state bent alienate their red state viewers. Then there was a point that even Comcast had to step in, which is the owner of NBC. Uh, it's loath to intervene in news coverage. Took the it took the rare step of conveying its concern to MSNBC leaders who uh, when some hosts and guests criticized Israel as the Hamas attack was unfolding on October 7th, according to three people with knowledge of the discussions. So what what is the, if you hear a motorcycle outside, the balcony doors open. It's Tuesday, sun's shining bright. Gotta let it happen. Gotta let the pets do their thing. Uh, and they're oddly quiet. <laughs> oh, the dog's on the couch. You can't see because the, uh, the mats that I worked that I cycled on this morning are sopping wet and they are drying. <laughs> the dog is napping on the couch. They had to do a course correction or at least uh, because uh, Comcast stepped in. MSNBC is now in this type of course correction. At least two dozen people with knowledge of the company's inner workings all asking for anonymity said that there are tensions in NBC because of the deal. So NBC Universal, the chairman of the NBC Universal news group, Cesar Conde, has said he wants his division, which encompasses MSNBC, CNBC, a digital streaming service, Telemundo, and Nightly News, Meet the Press, and Today, to be a big tent. He wants there a lot, and by that, there's a lot of cross-pollination. There's, uh, uh, you know, the NBC affiliates in middle America are going to be playing some stories from MSNBC. They're going to be pulling down and say, hey, we have a story for you. Here's a story from, um, I don't know, not Jen Psaki. I, was going to, I need to name a correspondent. I don't know any NBC correspondents. I got to tell you, I watch a lot of this CBS and CBS mornings. Um, here's, a, here's a story from uh, Nightly News uh, from, I don't know, that was aired on to today's show. Uh, it was done by, uh, what's his name, Craig Melvin? Is that his name, Craig Melvin? Yes, I do know his name. So there's a lot of cross-pollination when it, when it comes to that. But that also leads to people like Ronna McDaniel, who was uh, a former Republican Party chair who aided Trump's uh, attempt to overturn his 2020 election loss. That does lead to things like her being hired as a correspondent and trying to be somebody who is talked to on uh, nightly news, on the Today Show, on MSNBC, on CNBC. And then that's when you had people rebel. They don't, and also people in MSNBC do not like being called Fox News for Democrats, apparently. Executives inside NBC's corporate suites at Rockefeller Center say they are confident that viewers know the differences between the company's various news brands. Any related challenges, they argue, are of a high-class sort because their cable channels give NBC an advantage and relevance and revenue over its original big three competitors, ABC and CBS, which have no cable presence. Yeah, but they're on streaming. That's the difference. And they're doing, they're on streaming. I was going to say they're doing well. I don't think that's true. 
So they've got to be able to maintain trust and uh, present neutral fact-based reporting in a fractionalized era when partisanship carries vast financial and uh, cultural rewards. But they also have another challenge in that it must juggle a broadcast news operation, the company, bound by traditional standards of impartiality and a cable channel increasingly bound by the partisan uh, uh, preferences of an intensely loyal viewership. You know, MSNBC, I, I think is, I think it's too late for something like this to, to change. Would they, we, if any, you already, you have the voices, you, you can't just tell them to, to back up, to back off of, uh, what kind of stories they do. I mean, Rachel Maddow is frankly good at what she does and She's going and, and and if someone like her and Chuck Todd and, and Jen Saki, if if these people are doing a good job and they're preventing uh, preventing, they're uh, pursuing fact based journalism and they're putting it out there and they're and and that and that's what they're doing and that's and that's what their jobs are. I don't see a complete negative part of it. They could, you know, because if anything if they were to be the the Fox News of uh, of uh, the left, then they would be pre- presenting their own fake stories. They would do all the fear mongering. They would be telling left left leaning viewers, uh, middle left and left leaning viewers, uh, that the Republicans are out to uh, uh, not diversify to to. To make everybody white and blonde and, and and celebrate who Hitler is. I mean, they would be doing things like that the entire time. But they're smarter than that. MSNBC reporters and correspondents and anchors and bosses are smarter than that. This is for 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 Comcast to step in, that I get that. I understand that. You're running a business, you want to be able to appeal to everybody. But Right now, I think that that was a bit of a reactionary move for them because MSNBC is now at a point where it is it has an identity, and right now that is left leaning and 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 so be it that you know Fox News is is doing the the thing on the right and CNN is trying to aim for middle and middle right or whatever David Zaslav wants them to be. But for MSNBC to have an identity f- to show what is right and correct morally, and not try to and not try to uh, drag people and 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 put them down as much as their competitors do at Fox News, or be as uh, bland as what CNN and un- unsure of itself as what CNN is. <laughs> Again, hire me back to the company. And I will stop doing this. No, I will keep doing it. I'll keep doing whatever I need to do. It's written here that MSNBC has struggled with its identity before it moved to the left ahead of the Iraq war and later moved right by hiring new hosts like former Republican Congressman Joe Scarborough. Soon it shifted leftward again with uh, Keith, Keith Olbermann talking about anti-Bush and often anti-Fox commentary. But then Andrew Lack, a veteran producer, took over NBC News' division in 2015 he decided the channel needed to tone down its partisan image. Under Lack, who oversaw MSNBC's creation in an earlier NBC stint, the cable network bumped uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton from a weekday schedule, hiring the former Fox News anchor Greta Van Susteren and added more straightforward news programs, including a daily version of Meet the Press uh, with Chuck Todd. And there's there I mean you know the, again there's a lot of positive and negatives when it comes to this and and the criticism I do believe is valid but they're doing they're doing better news than what Fox News is doing and they're doing it again right and more and more correct and honest and yeah there's going to be some hiccups here and there but that's just what comes with it. Are you glad I didn't talk about CNN this time? There's more to it. Check out the story in the show notes. Uh, and this final one comes from Trip Mickle. Scarlett Johansson said no, but OpenAI's virtual assistant sounds just like her. As well, this all also comes from uh, the deal deal book 
newsletter. Scarlett Johansson and OpenAI's Trust Issues, written by Andrew Ross Sorkin, Ravi Matu, speaking of uh, CNBC or NBC, <laughs> Ravi Matu, Bernard Warner, Sarah Kessler, Michael J. De La Merced, uh, Lauren Hirsch, and Efrit Livney, as well as Alyssa Wilkinson, who wrote What We Lose When ChatGPT Sounds Like Scarlett Johansson. So, if uh, the, the, all of this encompasses one story. OpenAI last week announced uh, had a, had a, a, a showcase of ChatGPT 4.0, which is the a new iteration of their ChatGPT virtual uh, not virtual eh, ver- of OpenAI's virtual assistant, I guess. Um, that is uh, their a- the, its aim is to bring video and conversational aspects uh, over to its ChatGPT platform. And one of the voices, there's multiple voices. Uh, I downloaded the program. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know why I paused there. <laughs> but one of the voices sounded a lot like Scarlett Johansson's uh, character, uh, or lack thereof, from the movie Her. It's a fantastic movie. It is a movie I own. Uh, the problem is, she originally told them no. Sam Altman, the company's chief executive, remember he was fired and he was brought back, asked her twice. And she was like, no, thank you. (laughs) Despite those refusals, uh, as Trip Mickle writes, Ms. Johansson said, uh, OpenAI used a voice that sounded, quote, eerily similar to mine. She hired a lawyer and asked OpenAI to stop using a voice it called Sky. OpenAI did suspend the release of Sky over the weekend. Uh, the company said in a blog post on Sunday that, quote, AI voices should not deliberately mimic a celebrity's distinctive voice. Sky's voice is not an imitation of Scarlett Johansson, but belongs to a different professional actress using her own natural speaking voice. Her name is Marlet Momanson. Oh, God. (laughs) She said, and this comes from the Deal Book newsletter, I was shocked and angered and in disbelief. The company wouldn't confirm who provided the vocals, though Sam Altman tactily encouraged the the comparison, plugging the announcement in a single word, her, on social media uh, and writing that the new ChatGPT feels like AI from the movies. This is, uh, you know, when when Altman was let go from OpenAI, I remember, it, again, that was only a couple of weeks ago, maybe like a month and a half ago. It was a big story, and you felt for the guy because he created the company, and and there there was no reason that he should have been let go. And then you find out, you know, it was one of his friends inside the company that also, and that she, and then she was going to be hired to that position temporarily I guess um, uh, while he was gone and then finally the board just you know they let him back in but it, this as the deal book writers write it's just a sign of eroding trust around uh, in open AI it was reminiscent of fears that among Hollywood writers news publications authors and others about AI being trained on their work without their permission or compensation or replacing humans. This is what SAG and the Writers Guild and the Producers Guild and Directors Guild and everybody, this is what we're all fighting against in this entertainment industry. You should not want AI to write a script for a movie, no matter how quote-unquote good it is, or to make a song. We don't want that. That is bad. And I don't care how easy it is, it's not going to help. It's just gonna. If Netflix started making a movie out of uh, through AI, then you will you would never ever see uh, anybody in the industry ever work with them ever again. Now this one was important. This uh, the what Alyssa Wilkinson wrote uh, about what we lose when it comes to this AI thing, this ChatGPT problem. We lose the, besides the trust. The engineers interact in real time with ChatGPT 4.0. It becomes increasingly clear what part of the brain the voice is meant to tick. They used, I didn't know that there were female voices. I mean, male voices, rather. I didn't know there were male voices when I downloaded the app. 
which I was reticent against doing. I did not want to download that app on my phone. I don't want to have any AI except for Google Assistant and uh, Siri on the iPad and Mac. <laughs> Mac. But if it feels like we're making fake relationships, the the voice was flirty. She uh, she was the the female voices they used because I think there was like five total voices and three of them were women. But the voices were very flirty. They talk to you in this kind of lilt that makes you feel like you're being heard, <laughs> like like you're talking to a real woman that you met on Hinge or whatever. Like, hey, oh, she's she's giving me the time of day. Oh boy, it's time for me to really puff up my collar and talk about what we're doing in here. <laughs> or as uh, Al- Alyssa wrote, Alyssa, <laughs> as Alyssa writes. As I said, as Alyssa wrote, as Alyssa writes, it is deferential and wholly focused on the user. Well, go watch the video and you'll and and you'll be like the way that she's talking to them, the 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 chat GPT uh, voice. I don't want to say bot the AI because I don't want them to hear me and come back and try to kill me or something in 10 years when they take over. But go back and listen and and she the way like even even when she's just like talking like like there's a guy like like looking the video because because uh, like they, they can use your camera access your camera and like say hey what am I wearing she's like, oh you look good you're wearing a shirt <laughs> it doesn't sound as robotic as I made it sound. The OpenAI presenters said that ChatGPT 4.0, quote, brings a bit more emotion, more drama. But that's not something I exactly want. I If, if you're going to make it conversational, make it conversational. But don't make it something that is supposed to trigger that part of my endor- – the, 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 the part of the endorphins in my brain that, that makes me go, ooh, I want to bang this thing. <laughs> and we're stupid. Men are dumb. <laughs> You know what? I'll say it. Every human is dumb. Every human is dumb. If you're going to be flirting, it's, it is, it's, it's going to work. Oh, God. As Alyssa writes, she will never embarrass you, this AI voice. She'll never make fun of you or cause you to feel inadequate. She wants you to feel good. She wants to make sure you're okay, that you understand the math problem because they didn't ask her to do a math problem and you feel good about your work. She doesn't need anything in return. No gifts, no cuddles, no attention, no reassurances. She's a dream girl, especially for those people who look at this and they go like who spend all day on the internet, who, who are socially awkward to the point where they can't have a conversation with somebody, uh, let alone a person of the opposite sex. But they love Jon Stewart and Bill Maher. I think John Stewart's funny. I think he's a funny guy. Sometimes he says some things, and I'm like, all right. It makes you feel like you're part of the movie, and that's where her is. That that's where the problem is with her. That guy. That is. There's. It's not a happy movie. It's like that. Uh, the other movie, Upgrade, where that guy uses um, uh, uh, robots or nanobots to 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 make his life better. STEM, artificial intelligence implant called STEM to make his uh, body better. We, we don't want that. And to, and to a lesser point, don't let AI take over the industry or any industry. Don't let it be something that can replace you in a heartbeat. Anyway, all right, I'm done. Listen, there's no, <laughs> I never come to conclusions on these things. If you like what you heard here, head to the website, cpluscomedy.com, where I talk to your favorite people in the entertainment industry. I just finished. Look, AI can't have a conversation with uh, famous people, not like me. Maybe if I, <laughs> I was about to take down an outlet, but I'm not going to. I'm just saying maybe AI could replace the guy who hosts hot ones. (laughs) And I think he's a good interviewer. And I will say it to his face. 
I think the show is interesting. I don't watch the show, but I think the show is interesting. I'm just saying I don't think he's a good interviewer. It's two different things. I think there are a lot of great NBA players who have uh, – one of them is on Dallas Mavericks. I love the Mavericks. He's an anti-Semite. I can't support that guy. I can support the team. I can't support that guy. Seabliscomedy.com. <laughs> I just talked to Kate Willett, very funny comedian, about her new special. You can find that at You can find the video version of that interview on youtube.com slash comedy, as well as the video version of this podcast on uh, the same platform, youtube.com slash comedy. You can follow, you can find video versions of the other podcasts, The Constitutionals, which is the entertainment business news podcast on uh, the same thing. And uh, Late Night Lately, which is the Late Late Night Show Show. Subscribe to those wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Seaples Comedy. Find me on those platforms at Chad Black White. Rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends about it. Goodbye.